In a world where film, television, video games, technology, toys, lawnmowers, dark matter. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Lawnmowers, dark matter? Oh, uh, sorry. Where most of those things meet, one podcast stands alone, going behind the scenes. Hold on to your butt. I love it when a plan comes together. You're listening to the Media Juice Podcast. Hello, everybody. Jeremy Sneed here again with my producer, Jeremiah Isley. That would be me. How's it going? That's right. <laughs> of Moss Isley Cantina. Um, That's right. And you, we talked about it in the first episode. So it, it blows my mind that you, that was never a nickname to you. Like nobody, nobody caught on to that and was like, oh, let's just start calling, calling him Isley or Isley Cantina. Did that never happen growing it up? Never, it never happened. And I think I think it's because we grew up in the era of Star Wars when you couldn't like watch things and like people weren't like naming names all the time on the internet and stuff. Oh, so like yeah. I think Moss Eisley kind of got lost in all of that. And it's only been I think you're right. It was only later when people were started really Right, like, like the DVDs. all the obscure things started coming out and being made popular and Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's tons of fan fiction out there and dissertations about the Moss Eisley Cantina. But uh, when I when we were young, when the movie was just hitting its strides, uh, not so much. But yeah, it's like we didn't really know. I don't remember knowing like who Admiral Akbar was. Or yeah, yeah. I think I knew Boba Fett because like uh, his name was like on the toy or something. Yeah. But other than that, I didn't know that was that character's name. Right. Or like, yeah. you know, Bosk or IG 88 or Hammerhead or, you know, all yeah. those <laughs> <laughs> like who well, is now, Mo I'm, I'm a f- on anyway? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to officially deem your nickname here on this episode of the media juice podcast. Isley Cantina. All right. Just call me the Cantina well. for short. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Cantina. Cantina boy. Isley. Isley man. I'm going to, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to take back the official crowning and I'm going to think about it, but it's right, somehow going to have the word Isley in it. All right. That, that works. Cause you know, my <laughs> name, last name is Isley. So, uh, you can call me missing E. I don't know. Cause there's, there we go. I don't have the E on it. I, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of E's, okay, listen to this segue. Oh, let's Our see. next guest has several E's in his name. Ah. Uh, Ruben Langdon is a, a, a pal of mine that I met uh, four or five years ago. He's uh, uh, done motion capture, performance capture, uh, stunts for everything from Avatar to Ant-Man to... You were saying before we got on, what was the, the, some, some really impressive credits? The Office, which we will talk about. Yes. And uh, tons of video games, like you said, but um, off The Office, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Avatar, Dexter. He's done just about anything you can think of. He's been a part of, at least as a stunt uh, stunt man or stunt man or coordinator, coordinator or both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My friend, uh, Christine, uh, at PlayStation introduced me to Ruben, uh, years ago. And, you know, I told her what I was uh, doing with video games, the movie. And she was like, Oh, you got to talk to this guy. He does tons of mocap for, you know, devil may cry and, and Capcom. And, and I didn't know at the time he had done stuff for avatar and movies too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, fun, a fun conversation with Ruben just as usual. We always have good conversations here right, on the man. Media Juice Studios podcast. We take media, we take media, and we juice it. Okay, that's right. That's what we do. So, uh, <laughs> on top of that, we've got the cutscene segment. We're going to talk about the Red Dead Redemption Two trailer, which just oh, yeah. dropped moments Speaking before we record. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. And of course, we will take questions and comments from you, the listeners. And fans of Media Juice Studios in the script notes section. That's right. We will and, take script notes from you. See, that's sort of the the idea of script notes is they usually come from a network or a studio or a client. Yes. But in this case, the script notes are coming from you, the listener. See what we did there? See how that works? It's all a master plan to get right. you involved in the creation of this podcast. Or something like that. And with that, <laughs> I say we roll this thing. Roll it. 
You're red and you're dead and you're redempted. Follow your highest excitement. Yeah, never too late. Just go for it. I do stand behind a curtain all day. That's just what I do. Hey, everybody. So we're back here in the green room. And this week, really excited to talk to my pal, Ruben Langdon. Ruben and I met several years ago. We have a, a mutual friend, uh, Christine Converse. Christine uh, told me, hey, I know you're shooting a documentary about video games. You've got to meet this guy, Ruben Langdon, performance capture, motion capture, stunts, video games, movies, television. I've actually uh, filmed Ruben twice, once for video games, the movie, once for for Unlocked. Um, and Ruben, uh, number one, thanks for uh, joining us here on the show. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And number two, for for all the folks out there listening, can you tell them what it is, like, is there one title that describes what you do, or do you kind of wear multiple hats between performance capture and stunts and games and movies? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, it all sort of interconnects at at different points, motion capture sort of work that I that I'm used used to doing is um, I guess it would be acting performance capture. There's an, a lot of different titles for it. I would say to find a through line or the different many different hats. I don't know if there's one specific title per se, but uh, <laughs> I would just kind of say, you know, performance capture really sums it up in in a in a good in a good way. I would say that's probably going to be the best best way to to title it if that works <laughs> performance capture because it's that incorporates stunts that incorporates movement and creature movements that incorporates acting uh, anything really and it's all being captured by by some form of camera one whether it be on a mocap stage or in real life right uh, well the performance capture term tends to go more with the the physicality the motion capture world so whether it's a, a mocap suit, they have these new um, accent suits where you can do capture work outside or in different environments, or like in oh. Planet of the Apes, they used uh, a different system. They used they actually used infrared lights system on Planet of the Apes, but they set it all up outside. But that would when you're wearing the suit and they're capturing movements as opposed to capturing in a standard video camera sense where they're capturing your face so that's where the term performance capture would sort of come into play i, I would say interesting See, I, I didn't know that uh on planet of the apes they took the the volume as it were out, outside yeah they uh they were setting up the volume well the latest planet apes i am not sure about that i'd have to ask a few friends that worked on it um but i definitely know in the first apes and i believe on the second apes they um that's what they were doing they were and they were using LEDs to help boost instead of the, the markers system. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you're outside in the sun, you have so many different reflections. Uh, those red cameras pick up everything. So they were using LEDs to boost the marker sets. To, so the LED cameras, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, infrared cameras would only see the LEDs and not the rest of the all the other reflections going on in, in the daytime. So well, that's... It, yeah. That's interesting. Like um, the technical side, which of course you can't divorce the technical from the artistry and, and specifically with performance capture, whether it be for movies or games, can you t take people back? So obviously avatar was, was something that you worked on. Um, yeah. Can you, can you give sort of the evolution from your point of view of, of this technology and this, this artistry from sort of, say even pre avatar with devil may cry that you worked on to then avatar. And then now how have you seen it change? What's that evolution been like over the past eight, nine years? Yeah. Wow. Well, it's actually been, uh, maybe 15, close to 20 years now that I've been, I, oh, okay. I call myself okay. one of the, one of the old timers. <laughs> uh, I've been doing, uh, probably doing mocap. Uh, there's only been a, a, there's only a few of us that are still around doing it still, uh, that were doing it way back when the technology was just being developed. Um, I worked, was it 20 years ago now? 20 years ago, I think, uh, wow. on, Resident, on Resident Evil um, Code Veronica, 
that was a magnetic system, which was a tethered different wires and using uh, gyros, you know, like the accelerometers that are in your phone. And it had this huge sort of magnetic thing in the room, this box that gave off crazy electromagnetic waves that made everybody sick. And we, uh, oh we couldn't be in the room. We couldn't be in the room for more, more than about three hours before it would just be just dizzy and oh my gosh. falling over. And who knows? I was what... going to make a joke about that, but <laughs> no, <laughs> it no, it was real. Thing. It was oh, a real, wow. we were constantly taking breaks, like every two, three hours, uh, having to go outside suffering for, like, for your art. <laughs> 15, 30 minutes. You know, at the time we were like, wow, this technology is so cool. We're doing, you know, cutting edge stuff. Um, <laughs> So we didn't care, you know, we were just like, well, whatever, this is great. And it was the first Capcom game, I think, to incorporate motion capture into their game. We actually did the capture at the Sega Studios in, in Japan because um, it was a joint venture between Capcom and, and Dream. It was for the Dreamcast. It was a oh, big... Oh, that was Code uh, Veronica, you're right, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people still say it was the best Dreamcast game. Uh, out there so that was way back i think that was actually about 20 years ago that's yeah 1997 1997 was the year i did that so that was my first sort of entry into that world and uh to see the technology develop it's once which was only like a year around the same time they already had uh the infrared dot system you know and that we're still working with today and that technology really hasn't changed that much. The basic principle of the technology, the cameras have gotten better. The markers have gotten softer. When I first started working, uh, I remember some of the fir- first projects I worked on, we were using these big ping pong ball sized wooden markers. They were actually made of wood uh, because they had to be a perfect, perfect smooth sphere. And at that time, the creators of the markers didn't know that stunt people were gonna be falling on these. Things. So they just made them go oh, for, you know, what's going to be the most reflective. So when they, uh, when they created them and they put them on us, and then when we had to do stunts, I would come home with just welts, bruises all over my body, even though I'm falling on mats, it would still be because I'm falling on a mat with a piece of wood under the wood between sandwich you be, and the mat. Oh my God. <laughs> so, um, those were the early days quickly though, thankfully, uh, I think by the time we got to the year 2000-ish, a lot of the studios realized that, you know, the performers aren't going to last um, with the big wooden markers. So they started figuring out ways to, to make them rubber or, or soft foam and different things. And, but, and, the, and the markers started getting smaller and smaller and smaller until now you have, you have a various different makers and systems. Vicon's still a big maker. They started off in the business, I think, as a biotech doing, uh, using the technology, the motion capture technology for, for doctors in, in, in that industry. So it kind of it, it came out of that industry and then they formed their entertainment division and then they bought out House of Moves and they just kept going. So those guys have been around for many, many years, but there's new systems out that are much cheaper and even stronger, how to say with the infrared system. So it still is basically an infrared uh, world, still using infrared light, uh, which doesn't give you headaches and you don't have to take rest. In fact, they some studies are saying that the infrared light is actually really good for you. So who knows, maybe whatever years I took off during that Resident Evil project, maybe I'm putting them back on by being <laughs> exposed to all this infrared light. And, <laughs> you're getting, you're getting and like the, double vitamin D now for, for all of the yeah. deficiencies that, yeah. <laughs> know, so what's the, what's the difference? Um, this is probably a dumb question, but I just, you know, I'm looking on your IMDB here and obviously it's a, it's mm-hmm. a who's who of, of film television projects. When I see the word stunts, say next to right. you know Ant Man or next to right. Pirates of the Caribbean, are you on sure. set doing stunts there, or does stunts cover sort of a, a lot of the mocap work that you do? No, no, that's actually that's that's physical stunt work. Getting into costume uh, for Pirates of the Caribbean, it was uh, getting into a crusty suit or um, one of the soldiers. Uh, depending on the day and then doing sword fight battles and in, in the rain and swinging from the ships and getting killed you know all that stuff so uh, that's part part of my 
a hefty part of my career has been in the stunt world, uh, not just mocap and not just that. Uh, I'd say a, a large portion of my career has been in the, in the motion capture world just because of that to 1997 Resident Evil experience. I was one of the first uh, performers to, or first people to get exposed to that technology in the, in the early era and then sort of be comfortable around it. So through the years, uh, I keep getting called back to do mocap and motion capture, performance capture gigs because uh, it is a little bit of a different world. It's it's very much like a, being on a stage, I would say. If you have any kind of stage right. work, then you're that's probably a closer compatibility to, to a doorway, a closer doorway into that world. Uh, where TV and film work is, it's a whole nother, you know, it's 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 its own monster. But I, I sort of go back and forth uh, depending on the job, depending on the day, depending where I'm at, um, working on different projects in the live action space as well as in the motion, motion capture space. And now those and, worlds are, are mer- merging, which is awesome. And, and in terms of emoting, like I know you mentioned the stage, like – you know, someone that's on a Broadway show, obviously they're they're emoting uh, to the audience sure. in a very, you know, more deliberate, verbose way uh, because that's just the right. nature of theatrical performance on a stage. Um, how do you, you know, how do you determine like sort of like what level you need to emote, whether it's a stunt, whether it's a close up, like how do you switch hats or, or is it pretty much like, oh, I'm going into this gig and I'm going to be kind of operating at this volume? Yeah, you have to really kind of be specific for the project. Um, when it comes to motion capture nowadays, in the early days, because the technology was still in its infancy, the subtleties weren't picked up as much by the cameras. So, uh, or I should say, uh, I take that back. The subtleties were have been there for the most part, but the on the back end when they delivered the finals, like for PlayStation Two uh, or PlayStation One or even Dreamcast. A lot of the animations, uh, the, the details weren't there. You're looking at low polygon uh, cr- creatures or characters that don't have a lot of facial expressions. Maybe the fingers move. Um, for those characters, we had to sort of be a little bit bigger, larger than life to help animate right. them. Uh, and, give, because, and and they were very animated and, and just in their style and the, the way that game designers would would create these characters because they were low poly and didn't have all the detail that you have today so we we sort of had to boost our performances a little bit to to help the animators out to help give life to these characters uh That's over the development right? yeah over the years the technology the back end technology has gotten so good with the game engines and the rendering and the details now uh it's just like acting in a, in a TV show or in a movie where you bring everything down and you're not boosting anything. It's every little subtlety comes across with your face twitches. And, and I have to be careful of this sometimes because I'm so used to doing mocap. In the past, I was so used to doing mocap sort of larger than life, bigger, that uh, a lot of times I get told by directors like, okay, tone it down, Ruben, bring it down a couple of times. <laughs> tone it down a little bit there, <laughs> 1997. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's but, funny, like the latest uh, uh, Apes film, or at least the, the, definitely the last two, but the latest one for sure with uh, Andy Serkis playing Caesar, like there's so many close-ups of his face. And yeah. I feel like his his face and close-ups in general are, are just a, a, a different character in the movie because it's like, you know, obviously in filmmaking for, for generations, it's been like, okay, when you really want to communicate emotion, cut to the close-up. But yeah. In yeah. games and, and with motion capture, I mean, I, I don't know, right. you probably know better than I do, but it probably was avoided in some cases because it's like, oh, we're going to go to oh. this, like you said, this low polygon, like, ugh, you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I directed a few scenes back for PlayStation 2 for a few different games and uh, sat with the animators and sat with the, the game technicians and we would always have to try to find ways to cheat the... Um, the limits of the game engine because it could only, you can only have so many characters on the screen at one time. You can only have so many polys. So you would really be, be creative and, and yeah, not go in for the close up because then you're going to totally show all the flaws of the modeling and the limits of the game engine. So, and there still is some of that now, but 
what the game engines are able to produce now and the detail and the and, and the, the amount of rendering power it's just so unbelievable and i mean we are almost at that real life rendering like you can't tell the difference state you know we're, we're definitely there with with the pre-rendered scenes you know when non non-game engine stuff so like avatar or uh planet of the apes uh, the guys over at Weta and other, you know, game or not game, but uh, movie studios who have the big render farms that can put out this quality. It's amazing, but we're almost there. I'm looking at game engine technology these days um, through Unreal, Crytek, you know, Capcom, their engine. Everybody's creating these amazing game engines that are pushing out so much detail and it. it we're literally, I think we're right on that cusp where in probably another two, three years, there won't be a difference. Like we can't tell the difference between that world and reality. Well, and it's, to me, it's, I mean, we've talked with, uh, we talked with uh, Randy Pitchford from Gearbox and actually a, a few other people about this, this same topic, which is this convergence of uh I mean, not just art forms like you know gaming and, and film and television mm-hmm. which i feel like has been talked about for at least 10 years if not 20 but it's always been the- theoretical um but now it's it's sort of this combination of like filmmakers are used to the evolution of cameras and lenses and like okay right. every few years there's going to be you know a new lens or a new camera and and there, there's of course big spikes in that like so like when the DSLR came out that was just a revolution right. for independent filmmakers and Absolutely. and of course you've got GoPros and all of that stuff and now VR um but the point that Randy made was he said yeah you know as as a filmmaker you get new gear every now and then and but but for the most part the creative side you know writing the script coming up with your shot list getting the performances is the same but as a game sure. maker we have to we have to create our camera from scratch every single time <laughs> yeah and, and which that's, is and that's going back to your earlier statement question about mo- motion capture so when we're in the volume now and we're doing our these performances we don't know where the camera is going to be so it's kind of um Sometimes we do. Sometimes they have, you know, James Cameron uh, revolutionized the virtual camera and really use that in Avatar. So we could s- sort of act to camera uh, in that sense. But a lot of the video games and a lot of the um, uh, newer products that are coming out these days with uh, VR technology, um, VR headsets and stuff, they want the the viewer to have the freedom to move around and, and, and take the camera control. So when we're acting, we have to just be as natural as possible um, and not play to camera, but yet give a performance that's going to work from any angle. I was looking through your IMD page, IMDB page as we were getting ready for the interview. And I have to ask you about, I have to bring up the office because <laughs> right. I just have to. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's it's yep. interesting to me. I mean, I uh, I know a little bit about filmmaking and I, I've had my foot in, in theatrical production and all that so- sort of stuff. But you're you're credited in 16 episodes of, of stunt coordination for The Office, which is <laughs> right. a high impact, full go action series you know <laughs> like, what? Exactly. What, where, where are we going exactly. with this <laughs> that, was, that was one of my easier jobs yeah um, but i guess yeah, you know so explain for, maybe to to folks that would wonder sure, why is sure. there a stunt coordinator for a show like that yeah so uh when you know the office is a union show and for any any union show that requires any kind of putting the actors or performers in any kind of danger factor okay. um re- requires it, those shows need to have a sort of, I shouldn't say certified because there's not a real certification for stunt performers in the U S and other countries there are, but a, a, an experienced stunt coordinator, someone who's mm-hmm. been, you know, in the business and can sort of safety things and make sure nobody's going to get hurt. So for those, those episodes I was called into, and it was only, it wasn't every episode It's from here from time to time, there'd be simple things like, Steve Carell falling off of a uh, a table or bumping something, and a lot of times it was him or the rest of the cast doing their own 
their own stunt, but I would be there just to make sure, okay, well, let's put it, let's pat up your knee or let's uh, make sure let's sort of walk th through the stunt. So nobody gets hurt. And, and that's sort of the, 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 the role of the stunt coordinator is to do these as small or as big of outlandish, crazy um, physical feats or as simple as they can be, but not get hurt. And that's, and, and to be able to do take after take after take, depending on, you know, the, the camera angle and depending on what the director wants and to have that conversation with the director to say, okay, let's, you want this. Okay. I can give you that safely if we do it this way is that cool and then usually it's cool or they would say no i want this and like, okay let's try it this way and it's just it's just a safety issue really uh so i would show up on set and bring some mats and i think i had a stunt double for a couple of episodes uh where we had to they were doing a couple crazy things where i actually needed to bring a stunt double but for the most part it was just the actors doing their own thing uh and just making sure they were doing it safely and nobody got hurt Simple. It's interesting because, you know, no one understands, you know, the frame. It's like the frame of a show or of a movie is just that. What you see in that frame is what you believe to be happening in that world. But it's like, mm -hmm. of course, just off frame there, like you said, there may be a, a mat or, you know, if someone right. falls or someone jumps in, in, into frame or out of frame. It's like, that's, there's all kinds of safety concerns of, you know, where do they land or where do they take off from, or if they're, they're jumping from something higher or lower. And I think as an audience, people, you know, rightfully so take that for granted. Um, but yep. like you said, even in a show like The Office, where it, if it's as simple as someone falling off a desk, it's like, well, if you have to do 10 takes of that, then that could really not just hurt, right. but it could injure the person. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and and a lot of people, believe it or not, you know, a, a lot of actors are sort of half stage combat or have some sort of mm -hmm. physical experience. But there's a lot of actors who don't. There's a lot of actors who have never been in a physical situation or role. And then all of a sudden now you have the director saying, hey, I need you to do this. And they're yeah, and they've never been around that or have that experience. So it doesn't mean they're lesser than of an actor or anything. It just means they just haven't had that experience. So that's why the stunt coordinator is sort of there to walk them through it to demonstrate, okay, we can do it this way and we can do it safely. And everybody feels comfortable, everybody feels good, nobody gets hurt, everybody can go home and, you know, with as minimal bruises as possible. You yes, know, that's, as that's minimal the is the key word there, yeah. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I, I know you, you've got a time frame and I, I, I definitely don't wanna take too much of your time here, but no, no I wanted to ask you kind of one last question that, that we try to ask each guest for, for people that are look, you know, artists, creators, designers, uh, someone that's out there that's, I, I want to be an actor. I want to be a performer. I want to be a writer. I want to be a filmmaker. I want to be a game designer. Do you have any advice mm -hmm. for, for the people out there trying to quote unquote break in? Absolutely. The, so I, I'm one of the sayings I like to sort of put out there is always to everybody to follow your highest excitement and to do mm -hmm. it with integrity. And to, um, by following that, you know, a lot of people say, well, I want to be a director or I want to be, you know, and their image of a director is Steven Spielberg. You know, I want to be a yes. director. Now I want to be <laughs> Steven Spielberg. And you know what? That's great. But, and some people can be there in, you know, a year. Some people may take them a little bit longer, but never give up on your passion or your goal or your excitement. And that means to always, what in every moment and every second out of all the choices made available to you, pick the one, pick the choice, pick what's going to keep you in that, I say frequency because in that vibration, because uh, even if you want to be an actor and you live in the middle of nowhere and there's no place to act on TV, well, you can pick up a camera, you can write a story, you can start shooting your own little short movies and put them on YouTube. You can yep. uh, get a small group together and form a, 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 an acting group or a, a stage group, which most small towns actually have uh, mm -hmm. local yep. theaters or groups like that. So yep. as long and as long as you're making those steps and being in that, what I say, being in that frequency, you're going to attract the next thing, the next step, the next step. Yep. And you just keep going, climbing that that ladder of excitement. Uh, so I just tell everybody, if you want to direct, pick up the camera and start shooting things and then add some music and put it on YouTube, see, get responses. And that will lead you to the next step. So no matter where you are in this world, uh, 
you know, if you have a, if you have a phone, a, a smartphone, you have a camera, uh, there's no yep. excuses anymore. You can start filming, you can start directing, you can start acting in, uh, maybe you don't want to do the directing part. You just want to act, but you have a friend, find a friend, uh, in those, and that's where the theater groups and different things like that they bring together a whole slew of different people who want to just work in production and do the prop side of things or do the uh, wardrobe side of things. And then you find these groups, you find these people and you work and play and have fun and do things. And that'll just lead you to the next thing until you eventually you get to be where Steven Spielberg is. That's the idea. You know, it sounds right? easy, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, really, like what you touched on is really the process. It's like well, this is this is we're living life, and you know, yes, get, getting uh, acclaim for having something that's put out there, or even just recognition is always great. But you know, I always tell people that too is like, hey, enjoy the process. You only have one life, so if you like, you said, Ruben, just being attracted to what is going to excite you continually. That's that's great advice. And and so many times we're so focused on the end goal that we get caught up in that that we forget what we're actually excited about so yeah. forget that end goal have no expectation to what the outcome is going to be uh simply focus on right now i want to act start acting and if and if you feel like that is your passion if that's really what you want to do because a lot of people end up projecting ideas of oh i want to do this and i want to do that they actually do whatever it takes to get there and then they're there and they're like, wait, I don't like this. You know, yeah, maybe I don't they like do. This. Get yeah. That, yeah. Get, <laughs> I, they do get this role, you know, that they're this amazing role and they're on TV and they're like, wait a minute. I, you know, and so they were actually not focused on the, the actual acting part. They were focused on the recognition that the acting is going to get the result. Trust yeah. me, people, mm -hmm. the result. And let me tell everybody out there right now, there are way better, way easier things, ways to get money and fame outside of acting acting is then acting uh, yeah <laughs> acting is like the bottom of the list <laughs> acting is actually at the bottom of the list it may seem glorious from where you're sitting and you see the tv but to get to that stage uh, of if if it's all about the money and the glory and the fame go another route i tell you right now you're not going to get it through acting <laughs> yeah less painful routes indeed <laughs> but acting is truly if you're passionate about acting if you love the art of acting then by all means, follow that passion and do acting. Do acting every day if you can. Uh, and then that will lead you to, yeah, maybe there'll be fame, maybe they won't be. Forget about that. Really focus on what your passion is. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like a, a friend of mine I was just talking to about, about my same age, and she's she was lamenting. She's like, I, I regret that I never learned to play an instrument. I'm like, well, you're not dead yet. Exactly. Yeah. Go. What do, what do you want to learn? Exactly. Go pick it up. You know. Yeah. Uh, same thing. Never too late. Yeah. Never too late. Just go for it. Awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Ruben, thanks for your time, man. I, I I could literally talk to you for the next two hours, but I know you've got <laughs> things to do, and so do we. Uh, so from no, no Avatar and Resident Evil to uh, to Ant Man and 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 beyond, I'm sure we'll we'll be hearing more about your the career. office. <laughs> uh, la and the office, yes, the heights yes. of stunt yes. performance. The highlight of my career. <laughs> wall to wall. Action. Is there? Is there somewhere if people want to find you or interact with you online? Is there is there a, a better place than others where they can reach out or, or find you? Sure, I, I have a website, RubenLangdon.com, uh, just all one word, and um, uh, I'm pretty active on the social media with Facebook and Twitter, uh, Instagram, and that's all one word, Ruben Langdon. So Facebook forward slash Ruben Langdon, uh, Twitter for forward slash Ruben Langdon, all that stuff's just just my name, one word. So that's the best place to find me. Awesome. And that's R E U B E N, right? Correct. L A N G D O N last name. Awesome. Thanks, Ruben. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. It's time for cutscenes, and that means that you're all red and dead in in search of redemption again. I'm redempted. Yeah. <laughs> you're red and you're dead and you're redempted. So mm. yeah, we just we just watched the Red Dead Redemption 2 trailer. It literally just dropped moments before we recorded this episode. And um yeah, <laughs> it looks pretty wow. intense. Yeah. What well, stuck out to me, well, I mean other than all the different environments and 
and looks like a really interesting character. It looks like there's like alle- a huge alligator you wrestle or you go gator, yeah, gator hunting. Yeah, some kind of gator hunting thing going on there. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, There's uh, there was a lot. It was like a minute and 29 seconds and they packed a ton into it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, obviously it's anybody that's a gamer knows that this has been a highly anticipated title. It's been in development for, God, four, five, six years. Um, um, that may be wrong. I know at least four years. Maybe that's the number is four. But yeah, I, I saw it drop right before the episode. I said, we should definitely talk about that. I mean, in an overall sense, I feel like Red Dead uh, did something where it's like, obviously Rockstar as a developer with Grand Theft Auto um, ha- have defined and redefined the open world uh, game where you can do whatever you want, jump in a car, drive around all day or get out and, and, you know, get a gun and go on a shooting spree and just all kinds of stuff. Yeah. that's just like, okay, agree with it, disagree with it, but it's just sandbox fun. Um, I feel like with red dead, you know, taking that open world and, and putting it in, in the world of a Western, it was kind of one of these things where it's like, oh yeah, that's so obvious. Like, the Western is such a well-trodden genre, but really mm-hmm. hadn't been done in open world and definitely not with the rock star treatment yeah, until, yeah. until Red Dead Redemption. So obviously, you know, why it's so popular. I think about like when we were shooting my uh, last series, Unlocked, um, I think you might have seen this episode where I, I go to Kevin Smith's house and talk with him and, and Jay Muse about this kind of the state of, of the industry. Right. Um, we got off on this tangent about open world games and, and Jay is a huge fan of, uh, of, uh, GTA and Red Dead Redemption. So he kind of zeroed in on that and was, t- was talking about, oh, it's really cool. You can go out and you can ride and you can do missions or you can, you can roll out your sleeping bag and you can sleep and then you can wake up and you can decide to, to go fight the zombies, uh, or you can stay asleep and see. And, and so Kevin Smith's like, well, wait a minute. So you sleep in the game and then you wake up and <laughs> they had this like back and forth, which was funny. Um, but we kind of, it was kind of an opportunity to teach Kevin Smith about open world games. Cause I think he's more old school. Um, yeah. Right. Which was fun. Yeah. I think I, I remember the very first Grand Theft Auto, which was completely underdeveloped, I guess, as a game, I would say, you know, it was very top view. Top down, yeah. Yeah, you know, top down kind of thing. And I remember, though, going, okay, you know, people are making a big deal because they're swearing and they're, you can steal a bus full of kids and drive it off the pier and, you know, whatever. Uh, (laughs) But I remember (laughs) going, this type of game is going to change gaming because sand you know that it's now everybody calls it sandbox but nobody knew what to call it then they were just like you can go and do what you want like you just right you can do it it's like wait a minute but you can do what you want in other games no but it's different right right you you can do the missions or you can do the the jobs or whatever but or you can just walk around and steal things and and like you said putting it in that western world that western everybody knows westerns but there's not really heavy video game presence there either so right. and it works right. so well because you're in the frontier you're in the you're in the towns you're wherever and um it just it's a very cool and seemingly obvious place to put a sandbox game but it, it works really well yeah and i what i think is interesting about the evolution of of the open world genre is it's like we look at red dead redemption and Red Dead Redemption 2 as two separate games, and they are. But if you think about the man hours that, that go into, I mean, it's, it's. I think I heard something from Mark Cerny, the, the, uh, one of the designers of the PlayStation 4. It was something like, I don't know, 10 million man hours went into the development of, of, a, of a certain game. I can't remember the name of the game now. And if you think about, you know, these teams that they have now that are hundreds of people working mm-hmm. for, for years, it's like, look at Red Dead Redemption 2 less as a game and more of as this experience that, that like you're stepping into a world that, uh, that 
hundreds of people have created and you can do whatever you want. And there's, there's great, you know, strategic effort into balancing the open world with the missions and making it, you know, equal parts rewarding and frustrating to, to, to keep challenging the player. And that's what I think is interesting about the open world thing. Some people are like, Oh, I need, I need a linear path. I like, you know, Uncharted or Last of Us yeah, or you right. know, these games that are like, okay, level one, level two. And I like that too. Like I, sometimes oh, that's sure, what I other want. other place by all means. Yeah. Sure. But I think that, that it's just interesting to me, like looking at a title like Red Dead Redemption 2, like this is one game. It's like, yeah, it is one game, but it's this world that these people have created that you can live in. And I think, you know, combining to me, if some people ask me, you know, what do you think the future of games is? I, I really think it's going to be this combination of, of, of VR and open world. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how, mm-hmm. but, but combining those in a, in a novel and unique way to, to where you can, for example, like step into a room that's the holodeck that, and, and you pick back up on this West world esque story that you left off in where yeah. you're in the middle of a gunfight and it's like, Oh, let me finish this. And then okay, now I'm going to go over here and get a drink in the bar and talk to somebody here. Now, you know, that's all separated by a controller and a screen now, but if Mm -hmm. there's, when they find a way to combine the two, I really do think it is going to be, you know, Westworldy and someday. And finally, it's time for script notes. That time of the show when we take questions from you and Today, we're going to start off with a question from Instagram. It's Melissa Coleman who asks, hey, how do I get on the podcast? <laughs> um. <laughs> well, I guess, Melissa, we need to look at your username and see what it is she does. Um, I'm always interested to talk to uh, to interesting people. Um, I think the the point of this podcast is sort of people that I've worked with in front of the camera, behind the camera, so that there's some kind of starting off point there. Um, but you know what? Send us another message and tell us who you are and what you do. And if we if we can't have you on the podcast, at the very least, we can give you some advice yeah. on uh, how to pursue what it is, whatever it is you're doing. I'm, I'm all we're, we're bo- both all about that as yeah. fellow artists. Maybe so, uh, maybe like shoot a resume over or an IMDb yeah. page link or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's I'm a, I'm big on paying it forward. Um, Absolutely. Because as we talked about, I think it was in the Warren Davis episode just about, you know, certain or maybe it was Lewis Castle episode. It's like, yes, there's going to be those people that shut the door in your face. Yeah. But right. if, if you stay committed to your to your art form or to, you know, even if it's in business, um, people are going to recognize that eventually. I mean, yeah. you, you do have to develop a thick skin, but if you stick to it and, and your preparation will meet an opportunity and you'll get lucky. Absolutely. So. Stick to it there, Melissa, and uh, reach out to us. Let us know what's going on. Maybe we'll uh, help you out or someday bring you on the show. Yeah. You never know. (laughs) All right. Next question comes from Twitter. You can always tweet the show at Media Juice Twit. And uh, it's uh, at Kevin Outsider who wrote in and said, loved the screening of Unlocked at the DTLAFF which stands oh, yeah. for downtown LA film festival. He's headed back to the pack rim and wants to know is unlocked showing anywhere in the Pacific rim area. Well, and I guess heading back to the, by, by, by heading back to the pack rim, he means he- getting back into an enormous mech and, and walking back to his <laughs> charging station. Is that right? Oh, wait. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I take that as. <laughs> it's it's funny that he mentioned this because uh, we we do have some discussions. Nothing I can I can announce officially yet, but we do have some discussions with some uh, distributors over in the in, in Pacific Rim about Unlocked that uh, that might be bringing it to to that area. Right now, it's I think it's just uh, uh, United States, Australia, New Zealand, UK. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, thanks for coming, by the way, uh, the, we, we had a great turnout at the uh, downtown LA film festival, uh, screening unlocked, uh, the first night we screened unlocked episodes one and eight. And then the second night we screened episodes four and six, which were kind of all about esports. 
Um, so thanks for coming. Number one, that was a, a fun event that the, the guys at, uh, at DTLA, uh, uh curated a, a great festival. Um, and, uh, we had, we had fun doing that. We, we put some behind the scenes, uh, stuff up on the website and social media. You can check out, uh, Megan Camarena, AKA strawberry 17. She came out as well. And her and I had fun. We were being kind of silly walking the red carpet. She's, she's real fun. And, and, uh, posed in front of the unlocked movie poster. And, um, so that was cool. And the, the festival itself was fun. And hopefully to answer your question, hopefully someday unlocked will be coming to the Pacific Rim more, more to more to come there when we find out. There you go. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for yet another episode. So let's uh, let's put this one in the can. What do you say? Let's put it in the can because it's recorded on 35 millimeter film, and we do put these Absolutely. in cans and process them at a film lab afterwards. What? Else, how else would we do it? I, I couldn't think of another way to do it. There's no yeah, other so way this, to. So this episode will be out in about six months, and then uh, <laughs> our next one will be out in 2018. There it is. Um, <laughs> we want to thank our guest Ruben Langdon for coming on and sharing Thanks, his Ruben. time with us. Really appreciate that. We want to thank you, the listeners. Thanks to uh, both Melissa and Kevin who wrote in as part of the script notes segment. Always good to have folks writing in and asking questions. And uh, we want to thank you, the listener, for tuning in and being a part of this show. If you could find it somewhere in that cold cold heart of yours mm. or that warm fuzzy heart of yours yeah hey who knows <laughs> you never know i don't like to exclude anyone no let's to, get them all <laughs> yeah yeah if you would just uh in the itunes app or whatever app you're listening to just give us a rating a review even click that subscribe button so you get alerted every time we post an episode yes. it'd be so yes. so awesome that helps us be found by more folks and that gives us the sweet, sweet energy we need to continue doing this show. That's right. That makes that makes this one juicy podcast even juicier. It does. It gives us the juice we need to That's continue right. on. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. We'll see you next time. <laughs>